Welcome to the workshop, Graft vs. Host Disease, Advances in Prevention and Treatment. My name is Michelle Kosick, and I will be your moderator for this workshop. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Pharmacyclic, an AbbVie company, and Sanofi, whose support helped make this workshop possible. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Marcello Rada. Dr. Marcello Rada is a director of the Leukemia Service and co-director of the Long-Term Follow-Up and Chronic Graft versus Host Disease Program at the Colorado Blood Cancer Institute. He has worked in the field of hematologic malignancies and stem cell transplantation for nearly 20 years. His research focuses on late effects of transplant, graft versus host disease, and multiple myeloma. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rhoda. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for having me as a speaker. I'm always honored uh, to speak to you. Uh, so this, uh, my topic for today is a discussion on graft versus disease, how we avoid it, and how we treat it right now. So this is what we're going to discuss. I just mentioned to you some basics about graft versus host disease. We discuss how to avoid it, and we are going to discuss how we now treat it. In particular, I'm going to focus on the new drugs that we use. Just as a refresher, the transplant from a donor implies uh, the donation of the bag, the graft. This graft uh, coming from donor is made of many components, many type of cells. The two big components are indeed uh, the blood forming cells, the stem cells, the one that are going to replace ultimately the recipient cells, and also the immune cells coming from the donor. The immune cells coming from the donor can indeed attack the recipient, so they can be, are the ones that are responsible ultimately from the graft versus disease, but the immune cells from the donor are the actual therapeutic um, element of the transplant because they are the ones that can ultimately destroy the cancer cells and cure the cancer. The graft versus host disease is a direct consequence of transferring the immune cells of a donor into a recipient. Uh, the transplants are always built having immunosuppression after the infusion of the cells. This is always to prevent graft versus disease. In other words, graft versus disease is always expected. We can indeed eliminate it completely by removing the immune T cells from the collection. The problem is that if you remove the T cells from the collection, the transplant will also lack the graft versus leukemia effect. So indeed, uh, the graft versus disease and the graft versus uh, leukemia effect are intertwined, are connected together. And uh, in many ways, what we really want is really the graft versus leukemia getting rid of the graft versus host disease. Now, uh, graft versus host disease, as you know, is a, a different way in which it shows early post-transplant. We typically think about an acute graft versus host disease, generally speaking, in the first three months, but also seeping later on. Otherwise, what we mainly talk is chronic graft versus host disease, so it's an effect of the donor cells that may last years. Now, acute graft versus host disease remain a big problem of transplant and is a common issue. It occurs soon after transplant and in many cases when it shows up uh, can be difficult to be treated. Now the chronic graft versus disease is something a little more you know slow and progressive and it end up being the most serious and common long-term complication. Indeed there is not exactly two patients that have the exact picture of chronic graft versus host disease, and it tends to involve more than three organs or more in more than 50% of people. Treatment as of now are prolonged. So, indeed, when, we, when somebody goes for transplant, really how to define that the transplant has been a success is that, of course, you want to cure the blood cancer, but most of all, you want to avoid problems with graft versus host disease. This is the typical way in which we describe how we design the transplant. What is the recipe to do a transplant? There is an initial phase of conditioning. Uh, so these are all treatments that 
uh, you know, people receive before the infusion of the cells from the donor. And the conditioning is really to, uh, you know, prevent rejection and destroy the cancer cells. But what we are going to focus today is really what we do post-transplant. What is, uh, uh, you know, the post-transplant immunosuppression that is given to prevent graft versus host disease? These are just a few of those uh, combination of medication that are given post-transplant. These are the most classical combination. Cyclosporin and methotrexate is among the oldest combination that is given to avoid GVHD. Tacrolimus and methotrexate, tacrolimus and MMS, and then other combination with three drugs. This is what we would call, let's say, quote-unquote, the old, old way or the most established way to, to give uh, the post-transplant immunosuppression. As you see from the picture, the post-transplant immunosuppression is higher at the beginning, but it's supposed to be tapered down uh, possibly and coming off, say, between six months and a year post-transplant. But as you know, the truth is that GVHD may occur, and so folks need to be on immunosuppression for longer. Now, we are thinking about how to reduce GVHD using other ways more than using the standard approach. The first thing that we have to focus is on the graph itself. We have to look at the donation. As I mentioned before, the collection from the donor contains a mix of many kinds of cells. Stem cells are only one small proportion, but there is lots and lots and lots of immune cells indeed. Now, the, uh, some of these cells are indeed the players of the graft versus host disease. Those guys, you really don't want them. Those are the, the proportion of the immunity from the, from the donor that doesn't like the recipient. Those, we may call them alloreactive of the bad guys. But indeed, there are many other immune cells in the bag that we actually like because those are the ones that put some reason into the graft and allow for graft versus leukemia effect without giving graft versus host. So we, looking at, the, at the, uh, the collection, we start developing strategies to avoid graft versus host disease, really to help the good guys and to get rid of the bad ones. These are two strategies that we are using right now, and they are drastically modifying the way in which we do transplant. The first one is the post-transplant cyclophosphamide. So giving this medication post-transplant, and I'll tell you why. The second way is really to modify the graft to, uh, swift, uh, you know, to switch the balance toward graft versus leukemia and not graft versus host. Post-transplant cyclophosphamide um, is a, a treatment, uh, a prevention of graft versus host disease that is uh, relatively recent. It was first introduced uh, in Baltimore at John Hopkins, and now it is substantially the way we do many transplants ar around the world. The way it works is that uh, on day zero, you infuse the transplanted cells, uh, and uh, um, is a, 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 the, uh, we let uh, basically the, the little cells coming from the donor the T cells, but also those red guys, the bad guys, the alloreactive T cells in the infusion. And we basically leave these cells inside the recipient for two days. The alloreactive T cells, you need to know, they have the tendency to get angry soon. In the first 48 hours, they start to expand. They increase in their number. That's why you see more of this orange on day two. At that point, you give this form of chemotherapy. Cytoxan. Cytoxan is a, a, a immunosuppressive drug that targets cells that are actively dividing. So what happens is that when we give the cyclophosphamide on day two and day three, uh, the cells that, that cause the GVHD, they get removed from uh, uh, the body of the recipient. It's like you have an initial um, you know, you, you start forming all this mass of bad guys that will cause, in the years to come, graft versus host disease, and you get rid of them selectively. You, you like, you snip them out. That allow later on, all the other T cells, the ones that don't attack the recipient, thrive and eventually go on. 
Now, we know that this works because we tried. We have a lot of evidence that this has changed, really, uh, the, the transplant, giving much less GVHD post-transplant. We already have been using this for a while for transplant uh, that we call haploidentical, we do, when you don't have a 10 out of 10 match donor. But we are looking right now at using this approach virtually in all transplant. There has been a large study that was published, is this one that I quote here, CTN1703, in which we have been comparing an old way to give post-transplant immune suppression with the post-transplant cyclophosphamide. The way that this was studied was basically taking 431 patients that are given a reduced intensity transplant using typically uh, the donors that we use most commonly, well-matched donor siblings or unrelated donors. And the patients uh, were, uh, you know, were assigned to receive post-transplant immune suppression in the classical way, tacrolimus and methotrexate, 217 patients versus receiving this new approach of post-transplant cyclophosphamide. So if we go back and look at this study design, indeed, the patients were assigned to receive on one end the post-transplant cyclophosphamide versus the classic treatment. When we look at the characteristic of these patients, these were, uh, this was you know, uh, a group of patients that were very similar in the two groups. So they were very much comparable, comparable groups. About two-thirds of patients in each group received transplant from an unrelated donors, where at times we are more concerned about GVHD. And about 60% of these patients were treated with a diagnosis of leukemia. Now, when we look at their outcomes, uh, we found out that when we look in the long run, we see that patients that received the post-transplant cyclophosphamide were much more likely to not to have any graft versus disease one year post-transplant. So there was an improvement of about 20%. So post-transplant cyclophosphamide, 53%, no GVHD one year post-transplant versus about 35% in the other arm. So this was already a great result. When we go down and analyze acute graft versus host disease, chronic graft versus host disease, we found that post-transplant cyclophosphamide was cutting down by 70% the acute graft versus host disease. And the incidence of chronic graft versus host disease at one year went down from 25 to 12%, so 50% less. When we look at the at the presence of relapse, so the leukemia or the lymphoma coming back, we found out that both regimens were equivalent. So given the post-transplant cytoxin didn't make the transplant less anti-cancer, but really make the, 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 uh, the GVHD much less common. Also, we saw less transplant mortality, much less people dying because of transplant using this approach. With these, Basically, this came out of the press in December of 2022, so these are recent data. And right now, in 2023, post-transplant cyclophosphamide is the new standard of care. So this is what we are going to use moving forward. This means that substantially we will see, moving in the future, less chronic reversal disease using this approach. There are other ways, indeed, to uh, uh, reduce graft-versus disease. Once again, using the same concept of looking at the donation, manipulating the donation. Again, always try to get rid of the bad guys, but to you know, um, nurse and help the good ones. Another way would be just acting on the bag itself. We thought, why don't we just remove the bad guys and we just don't give the good guys or just don't expand the good guys? This was done in many centers across the United States. And the bag from the donor was indeed, uh, um, uh, we use a technology when we could separate, we can identify the cells. And in particular, we could identify, let's say, the bad guys, so what we call the naive T cells. And we could remove them from the, 
the, uh, the bag, and we can just infuse along with the stem cells the good T cells. This, was, uh, this type of approach was done uh, in a large number of patients across the United States in many centers. And this was first published in 138 patients. And what we noted is that with this approach, the proportion of people with you know, acute, important, grab versus disease was much reduced, was about 4%. So it was reduced by about a third. But also the proportion of people with chronic grab versus disease went down significantly, went down to 7%. So it was reduced by more than 70%. And no, none of these patients had a bad form of chronic grab versus disease. We also saw that patients indeed were more likely to you know, to survive the transplant and to do well, as well as they, the chance of fighting and curing the leukemia was not reduced by this approach. So this, is, this was one uh, very promising way to do it, really acting on the bag itself. Another way, more than just getting rid of the bad guys, is an, an, a new technology that has been uh, uh, shown to be very successful, which is more uh, toward helping, benefiting the good guys, the T cells that indeed protect the recipient from the GVHD. To do this, uh, uh, there has been uh, uh, all these reports from 2022, and we are going to see more in 2023, of a technology in which we can separate the regulatory T cells, the good guys, while all the other cells that we call T cells, and among the, all these other, there are the bad guys, those guys, they can be separated. The way in which we have been using this approach is basically by splitting the transplant in two infusion. An infusion number one that is given, as we say, on the day zero, include the stem cells. But also along with the stem cells, you are going to infuse also the good guys. For two days, the good guys can indeed expand. So the number of the cells that will protect the recipient increases and basically make the body of the recipient an environment where um, the, uh, the, the, the incoming rest of the conventional T cells from the donor will behave better. So this type of uh, two-time infusion on day one, on day zero, stem cells, regulatory cells, and wait two days to give the rest of the T cell. It's been actually very successful. Here, the, the study that was published indeed indicated 127 patients. All these 127 patients had a lot of uh, leukemia, and the, um, these, uh, the outcomes of these patients treated with these uh, type of technology was compared with a control group of patients that had the same characteristics. And the control groups come from CIBMTR. So these two patients, the treaty 127 and 375, had the same characteristic people with same disease, same age, same uh, division between men and women. Now, here we also saw that using these a technology that we call ORCA-T, uh, the number of patients, the proportion of patients with acute grab versus disease was cut by a third. So the, ch the chance of having acute grab versus disease severe went from 16% using a standard approach down to 5%. And the proportion of people of chronic grab versus disease, I mean, look at this, went down from 38 to 6%. The chance actually to be relapse free one year post transplant jumped from 62 to 81 percent and this also suggests that this technology not only prevent GVHD but also keep the graft versus leukemia effect and keep the advantage of the transplant itself the um, the one one element that was a huge um, indicator of the success of this new approach is when you look at patients one year post-transplant, and in particular, you look at the patients, the one year post-transplant, they were alive without disease and without GVHD. And when you look at that 
that there was the majority, 76% of the patient in the ORCA-T group uh, was uh, uh, alive, disease-free, and without GVHD. So those were really successful uh, transplants as we define them, cure without uh, GVHD. In the CIBMTR control, the historical control, the proportion was 34%. There is right now a multi-center study throughout the country uh, that uh, will, will keep utilizing this new technology to try really to see whether this might become indeed a new standard of care. So, so far we have discussed extensively about how to prevent GVHD. That was, if you think about the first part of my discussion with you today. Now we're going to talk about graft versus disease treatments. And I will discuss in these mainly the new FDA approved medications. Now, as you know, the, um, for when graft versus disease shows up, classically what we have been using to knock it down is uh, steroid, using steroid, prednisone, solumedrol, these are, what, these, these are the medications that, that are used first to knock down acute and chronic graft versus disease. But as you know, the problem is that the proportion of patients that respond to steroid is about 50% or less at times. And the problem is that the steroids are toxic and at times patients, uh, uh, folks cannot get off the steroid because their GVHD, you know, as soon as the steroid dose goes down, the GVHD gets worse. When steroids don't work, up to this point, we never had uh, good options, like additional treatment, like uh, other things like uh, photophoresis or other immunosuppressive drugs had not been proven to be as effective and have their own toxicity. Of course, there is no one treatment that fits all patients for graft versus host disease, and a lot of treatment historically have not been working. Moreover, a lot of treatment may be toxic and may need to be uh, needed lifelong, so folks end up staying on this medication for the rest of their life with a lot of impact on their quality of life. Now, the ideal treatment, needless to be said, needs to work. It needs not to give too much adverse effect. In particular, not reduce immune defenses too much or damage other organs. Now, the drugs that I'm going to discuss are drugs that you guys are already familiar with. I just want to point out the fact that the use of this drug is recent. Their FDA approval was starting in 17, and 2021 was a key year for approval of drugs for graft versus of disease. Now, uh, you have to consider that before the approval of these drugs, we didn't have uh, the, the, the agent that we have been using were never truly FDA approved. And the uh, uh, results with those agents were very much, uh, you know, um, limited, and there was a lot of toxicity. So the three drugs, ibrutinib, uh, ruxolitinib, and belumosudil, so Imbruvica, Jacafi, and Resuroc, are the three, three items I'm going to discuss with you. Let's talk about ibrutinib. Ibrutinib is a medication that was first approved for treatment of lymphomas and leukemia. So it was already a pill that people was taking, even taking for a while. So we were already using this drug in many people. So we already know the adverse effect of this drug. Eventually, it was discovered that uh, by treating the, these lymphomas and leukemia, you can also treat um, B cells and cells that are involved in, in graft versus disease. We found out that ibrutinib can block the B and T cells that are the bad guys responsible for a GVHD they stop the whole machinery of graft versus, the, the chronic graft versus disease, including the production of autoantibodies, they are the ones that target the organ, and also has an anti-inflammatory effect, if you wish, by reducing these substances that hurt the recipient. Now, the original studies included a limited number of patients, but on the original studies, the results were actually way better than what we had up to that point. These studies were originally came out uh, in 17. A longer follow-up was published in subsequent years. And we saw that in about a third of patients, graft versus disease went away completely. And the results were uh, fairly uh, long-lasting. 
And most of all, we saw patients that had very tight sclerotic skin, so a lot of fibrosis and tightening of the skin, where we saw a, a response with, an, a, a, uh, with the, the tissues and the skin becoming softer. The adverse effect of this drug make it always uh, something to be watched closely. The typical adverse effect that we saw is this arrhythmia, irregular heartbeat. But indeed, people can have a lot of bruising for, from uh, while on this drug, ibrutinib. Sometimes we saw issues like pneumonia or whatnot. So ibrutinib is always a medication that has, has been having that limit. We continue now participating in collecting data on people treated with ibrutinib really to nail down what is the overall value of this drug in treating chronic graft versus host disease. Indeed, the ibrutinib is, is, has to be mentioned because it was the first drug truly approved by the FDA to treat chronic graft versus host disease. The next drug that you guys know very well is Jacafiruxolitinib. This drug is a drug that was um, approved initially for treat, to treat other diseases, myelofibrosis, polycythemia vera. That means that we already know that the drug was tolerable and could be given to people for a long time. It turns out that Jacafi was found to really modulate the immune system, to kind of uh, put to sleep, say, the bad guys and increase the number of those regulatory cells that fight or that switch off the graft versus host disease. So it's more of an immunomodulatory drug. This is very important because the key of these new drugs is immunomodulation rather than immune suppression. Because immune suppression means getting infection all the time and needing to be on antibiotics forever. These newer drugs don't have such an important immune suppressive effect but they really are more smart in the way of modulating the immune system. The first uh, evidence of this drug working in graft versus host disease was with acute graft versus host disease. There was a large study, initially started in Europe, where they assigned people to receive uh, um, this drug. In particular, people that were assigned had bad acute graft versus host disease on steroid, and the steroid were not working and we saw an improvement of their uh, symptoms in 62% compared to 39% when you use anything else. So this was a jump in improvement compared to a very you know, lack of, uh, of effective on, on the best available treatment at the time. We also see many people, graft versus disease, going away completely. And this was seen in the acute graft versus disease. So folks that are treated, generally speaking, in the first three months, sometimes six months post-transplant. Then a subsequent trial uh, showed the, 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 how much this drug can work in chronic graft versus host disease. And again, this was done by uh, uh, you know, trying uh, and comparing uh, this Jacafi or Ruxolitimid to the best available treatment. And, the, and we saw that uh, patient did twice, so the the good outcomes increased from 26% of the available treatment at the time to 50%. So these represented indeed a large improvement. And when we say best available treatment, we are talking about all these other things that you do, MMF, photophoresis, adding other immunosuppressive drugs, giving more steroids, etc. We also found that these responses were lasting longer and there are many folks eventually that could progressively come off ruxolitinib without having any problem. The quality of life across the board from these studies and others uh, were improved post-transplant. The one thing about ruxolitinib is that one of the most typical effects is that folks' uh, uh, hemoglobin goes down a bit. People can get anemic. The platelets may, may go down some. And... Uh, uh, there is always something to watch that for a long period of exposure, there has been a signal for fungal infection. So folks that had a fungal infection that end up on Jacafi may need to stay on the antifungal longer. Still, we don't have yet a standard that tells us that everybody needs to be on the antifungal, but this is always something to look. Uh, the next drug is like the new kid on the block as far as what is being approved and what we know that works. This drug is called Belumosudil. 
we had, last time I presented on this meeting, the drug was not yet uh, approved, but there was a lot of question when it's going to be approved. Eventually, it was finally approved in, uh, later in 21. This drug was designed, was not used to treat another cancer like Ibrutin and uh, Jacasi. This drug was uh, specially uh, studied and designed to, fi to fight uh, the diseases they call that cause chronic inflammation and fibrosis. And the way it works is really as to modulate the immune system in a similar way than Jacafi in to some respect using a different mechanism. But indeed the other effect that we have been looking for is an anti fibrosis effect. So so this is really to treat and to prevent the formation of the tight skin of the joint tightness, of the dry, dry mounds, or the dry, dry eyes, which is what we see in chronic GVT. When, uh, this was, uh, when we treat patients uh, with belumosity in the, in the original study that took eventually, along with another study, to approval, we saw improvement in about 77% of people that were treated. And the patients that were treated in the studies had bad GVHD. Most of them, they were on, uh, on photophoresis or on many other medications. And what was very important is that while you put patients on this treatment, you see this improvement, you remove progressively the other medication. The drug was overall very well tolerated. We didn't notice that there were people that we had to take them down, take them off this drug because of the, uh, they had too much uh, uh, toxicity from it, they got sick from it. It didn't affect their counts, and we didn't see that they were getting an excessive number of infections. So this is not a drug that is considered to be immunosuppressive. The other cool thing about this drug is that this drug has worked in patients that where uh, Jacafi and Ibrutimid didn't work before, which is an important concept, meaning that we have these three new drugs, but you can use them sequentially. If one doesn't work, you can move to the other because they work in a different way. And as we can see here, we saw response where other, the other two drugs didn't work. The thing about uh, belumosudil, these are the adverse effects that are listed. The typical adverse effect that we have seen was the liver number going up. I have to admit that the fatigue, edema, headache, GI upset are reported, but I have never seen them uh, after prescribing this to a lot of people. And uh, there is not really a lot of people well where this drug was stopped because it was toxic in any ways. There's a couple of points I wanted to make while we discuss about this newer treatment of uh, GVHD, Ibrutini, Jacafi, and Resuroc. These newer drugs are indeed what we are using now. We have to use them more early. So we want to avoid people to stay on immunosuppression forever before we think using these drugs. And an important key is always to remember that when you treat chronic reverse disease, all these three drugs, when you measure that they work, they take a while to work. So you want to expose somebody at least for three months for this medication, Ibrutin and Jacafi or Belumosudil, before seeing an effect, before making a statement, this is working or this is not working, this is time to move on. So three months, in my opinion, remains the key. We have a lot of new drugs on the horizon. One of the drugs that is promising and research is expanding in the use of this drug is a newer drug that is different. It's not a pill like the three that we just discussed. It's not a medication given by mouth and taken every day. This is indeed an antibody, a medication that is given in form of an IV or a, uh, on an infusion uh, that is given every two weeks uh, or can also in different uh, uh, description could be given every three weeks, but every two weeks is how it was published. Here they treated 40 patients with very bad graft versus host disease that got a bunch of treatment before. Most of them got ibrutinib, 50% got ruxolitinib, a proportionate belumosudil. So these were those situations that were very hard to treat where the newer drug didn't work as well. So this drug was given in infusion every six weeks and there was a quick response. This was an important uh, point of using this drug. 
in, within the first month, there were a response uh, um, in the about 50% of people and 67% overall improved. And we saw some improvement in many organs, uh, including mouth, but also liver. There is also some signal in lung, for example. This drug, this is called axalitimab, is an antibody that blocks macrophages, so cells that are kind of the, uh, the final killer of chronic reversal disease are the ones that harm people uh, at the very end uh, in, in the mechanism of the chronic reversal disease. So these monoclonal antibodies, this, this drug can block exactly those cells uh, and kind of switch off really that, that inflammation, the chronic effect of graft versus disease. The drug in this report was very well tolerated, and we are now participating, including my group, in a, a clinical trial to continue uh, see how, how well this works. So there are many, many, many treatments on the horizon. This was my last slide, and I wanted to uh, finish really mentioning to you how much in these years things are improving. And with the, the, the new way to prevent GVHD, we are going to see less chronic GVHD in the long run. That's a fact. The other um, thing is that um, these newer treatments, indeed, uh, uh, as I mentioned, they were appro approved since 2017, but the most effective were just approved two years ago, really made a difference. And many other treatment modalities of chronic graft versus disease that are less effective, you know, my anticipation that we will see those less and less. With this, I really want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank, most of all, my, my dearest patients, my nurses, my colleagues. Uh, we are all uh, really, we are all in this together. Um, pharmacist, transplant coordinator, case manager, social worker, and administrative staff in my site keep really supporting uh, my work and, and my patients. So I have to, to thank you. And, and thank you for your uh, uh, attention, and I'm glad to get questions. Thank you, Dr. Rada, for your excellent presentation. I do want to correct an error in the introduction. It originally said that your research focuses on late effects of transplant, graft-versus-host disease, and multiple myeloma, but it should have said leukemia. Dr. Rada is a leukemia expert. We will now begin the question and answer session. There are a lot of great questions, Dr. Rada. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with um, this as a first one. There's several on um, uh, photophoresis, um, but let's start with this one. Once you have graft versus host disease, immunosuppression is the answer. Do you think of immunosuppression like insulin with a moderate diabetes necessary for life, or is there an opportunity to come off the immunosuppression? How do you evaluate the timing of decreasing immunosuppression? And in brackets, they have use of Regiroc or Jacopy or prednisone. So, uh, so uh, yeah, this is a great question. Um, so th there's a couple of things to consider. It is true that classic immunosuppression, that, let me make sure, uh, classic immunosuppression and t the steroid is a typical immunosuppression, is a little bit blind. It suppresses the good and the bad because we really want to suppress the bad, right? The problem is that when we suppress the bad, we, when you use, you use standard immunosuppression, you end up knocking down the good as well. So if you think about uh, that, that classic immunosuppression has always a role post-transplant in the early phase. But in my opinion, moving forward, more than immunosuppressive drugs that work with good and the bad, including steroid, we have to consider these more smarter cells that are really focusing on the bad guys, that modulate, kind of enriching, helping the good ones, and knocking down the bad ones. So in other words, it is true that when you patient that shows up and has GVHD, you give them something to make it quiet down. And that's, generally speaking, always something immunosuppressive. But the next, next thought you have to have in your mind is to uh, make a plan to Take, take down the immunosuppressive drugs using as, a, you know, a spare, a, 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 a really a, the actual treatment, an immunomodulatory drug. 
So ultimately, for example, when you prescribe steroid or prescribe this tacrolimus, all the immunosuppressive, you have always to have in mind the concept of getting them off. You need to get them off progressively and, to, and you have to watch the person very closely. And coming off an immunosuppressive drug may take multiple months, say uh, a minimum of a couple of months or sometimes longer. Sometimes the use of the new drug allow for that tapering to occur in a safe way so that when you go down with the immunosuppressive drug, you don't have any flaring of GVHD. Ultimately, what the goal that we want to have is for the donor and the uh, recipient to live together in tolerance, so doing fine without need for any of these pills. And uh, the, these in no, newer immunomodulatory drugs appear to be the most promising route eventually to come off all medication post-transplant. Thank you, Dr. Rhoda. The next question is, what kind of success are people having with ECP treatments for graft, chronic graft versus host, and what type of graft versus host responds the best to photophoresis? So, yes, photophoresis or ECP uh, has uh, historically the best results in chronic graft versus host disease, and typically the one that make the skin tight and uh, um, remove, uh, reduce the range of movement of the, of the joints on that sclerotic form. Uh, that's typically where we saw photophoresis working well. Now, uh, we also have been using photophoresis for acute graft versus host disease. There, though, the signal to be working is less. So generally speaking, photophoresis works best in chronic sclerotic graft versus host disease. Something that we have noticed in recent years, in part, I'm seeing this in my center, for example, is that these new drugs uh, that I mentioned in the presentation basically um, take away the need for a lot of photophoresis. As Michelle knows very well, up to a few years ago, we were doing more than 1,000 photophoresis per year, uh, 1,300. The most recent data that we have is that we are doing a few hundred, maybe 300. So we went down very drastically because the, these newer drugs have been proven to be more effective. Absolutely. One of our viewers said, I love hearing your last point. However, I am disheartened sometimes when I see the mortality stats associated with lung GBHD. Do you think that these new medications are changing those mortality stats? I, I think so. I think so, and uh, um, you see the ultimately if you you know when you the, the thing that is very very hard about chronic graft versus disease is that uh, when it starts and is established and there is a lot of damage uh, to the tissues to the lungs, the lungs become more tight, the airways become become more tight as well uh, you really need to to, uh, to really to make people live better and live longer, have less mortality, to act before the damage is established, before the tissue is completely fibrotic, right? The idea is exactly that one. If we can reverse those mechanisms of fibrosis or make them stop and maintain functionality, right there we will see better outcomes. And I'm confident that's what we're gonna see in the future. There are many pictures of chronic graft versus disease that we hope with this new treatment, but also with the new way that we design transplant, that we should not see them in the future. Yeah. Can ResuRoc be used as a first-line therapy as soon as bronchiolitis obliterans is diagnosed and confirmed with PFT and lung CT? So, technically, when you use uh, uh, this a drug like ResuRoc, uh, the way in which uh, the drug is approved is, uh, is approved in patients where their disease has been steroid refractory. In other words, uh, if you go by the book, you cannot use it first line. You would want to start first a steroid, and when you see that the steroid works up to a certain point, then you can request the drug and get it. Uh, indeed, it may, the drug may not be by the book, you cannot use it right away, but let me tell you that the drug 
the drug or those type of drugs come to my mind first. So while I'm starting the steroid, I'm always I'm starting also, you know, trying to procure the drug for the patient. And then if you know the the picture gets got better without using it, we don't use it. Otherwise, we get ready to use them soon. One of our viewers has a question. I have lung GBHD, and I have taken Jacopy for years. I know Resurock is a promising new treatment. However, I have tried it twice and gotten lung infections both times. Any data or thoughts on this, or am I a one-off case? No, you're not a one-off case. It's, it's so hard. Lung chronic gravitational disease is one of the those tough situation. Now, the, um, it's true that uh, um, it's, uh, um, the, the main problem is that folks with lung GVHD have the tendency to get infections so much because they were on immune suppression for very long, because the structure of the lung and the immunity at the level of the lung has been messed up. So it's very easy to get pneumonia, and those pneumonia can make the GVHD and life much worse. So, yes, you are not a one-off, and the treatment can be really, uh, you know, frustrating. You try something, and, uh, again, you don't know whether something works or not. Other thing that is, you know, big, a big part of it is that when you start these new drugs, they need time to work. They need to be well absorbed and taken consistently. Uh, so the idea really to see whether the drug is being causing the, the infection is always a bit questionable. You don't know. But no matter what, if you make a try on a drug, you need to stick with that for a while. And again, the, resu the, the results are not, you know, uh, of course, they are not 100%. Sometimes they are in the order of the 50%. This is why, for example, we have to bring up these newer drugs, like the, la the, the very last that I discussed, because we continue seeing folks that despite the new drugs, I brought in Jacafi, Resuroc, they still have a lot of problems, so we need more things to be done. I have bronchiolitis obliterans from chronic graft versus host, and I've been on 10 milligrams prednisone for 20 years. I still have frequent exacerbations of shortness of breath, would you consider transitioning to Resurock? When do you start steroid taper after starting Resurock? So in a, in, a, in a case that has been on steroids for, tw for 20 years, yes, I would consider starting a newer drug, Resurock, good example. Uh, the, I, I generally speaking, I am a, a big proposer of uh, reducing progressively the steroid. Uh, sometimes, as you know, when you go down, uh, you may get sick, you may get more short of breath, or sometimes you may have exacerbation, so they bump up your steroid again. Generally speaking, my general way that I practice this is to establish extremely slow steroid taper, even going down by from 10 to 8 once a month, and plan to come off in the matter of six months or so, and also helping with the adrenal. But definitely, uh, I would consider using Resuroc right now. Yeah. I have been. I'm using my st son's stem cells for transplant. Does that mean I have less or more chance to get graft versus host? So consider that if you're using your son stem cells, uh, your son, in particular, if the transplant is designed with what we call post-transplant cyclophosphamide. That's what I designed, uh, that, that's what I showed you before. So chances are that you're going to use that post-transplant uh, immune suppression, uh, which that's already is the standard of care. If you receive cells uh, from, a, from a son or from a parent, that's we, what we call haploidentical. So if you get post-transplant immune suppression, then we would anticipate less chronic graft versus host disease. These are the data that we see. That's why we would use that, the post-transplant immune suppression right now. So the, the, the answer is that, yes, you should see less chronic graft versus disease, but you want to ask your doctor, am I getting post-transplant cytoxin, cyclophosphamide? And uh, you may also ask, uh, why not? That's great advice. 
My transplant was six years ago under the old process. I have bad graft versus host disease. Can I use these new medications to control my GVHD? Yes, if you have GVHD established, you can use uh, these newer drugs uh, if it's a pro, uh, you know, if it's uh, appropriate. And uh, you know, if you are now on, still on immune suppression, and uh, there is the feeling that you are stuck on this immune suppression, or uh, when you start uh, tapering off the immune suppression, the GVHD comes back. Uh, that's when you want to think about the newer drugs. Have you seen any treatments that have helped with trunk scleroderma? Yes, I, I've seen it, and I see it. Uh, I've seen it in in my practice. Uh, I've seen, for example, well, the the this this tight trunk. Uh, we saw some responses with made, with photophoresis has been working. The proportion of success is limited, but it's been working some. Then there are other, the drugs that are indeed approved, including, I, uh, we saw about a 30% with people with this titanium getting better with ibrutinib. So it's not a full success, but it's better. And we saw improvement in folks with uh, um, uh, Jacafi and also with Belumosudin. Now, we have, to be, we have to really be clear on the fact that that tightening, that sclerosis, has to be tackled soon. Because that sclerosis, when the skin, uh, the fibrosis and changes the way the skin is, is very hard to, re to make it reverse, to make it go back to how it was before. When the, it's like a scar. If the scar is there, it's so hard to have the scar go away. So, uh, but indeed, the treatment that, that work in that are really what we are looking at. And even the last drug that I discuss. Uh, the one on clinical trial, is really looking at this specific issue of that tight skin on the trunk. Of the three medications you discussed today, which one is the best for bronchiolitis obliteran? The answer is that I don't know. Uh, I, uh, generally speaking, the, so we saw some lung results uh, in uh, um, in the study with the Jacafi, we saw some lung results also with the Belumosudin. It, that's still a very uh, difficult, uh, uh, but we, we don't have comparative studies uh, using one versus the other in folks with this specific, uh, um, with that specific problem. So the idea is to, to jump on one, also looking at the adverse effect. For example, if you're very anemic, uh, maybe Jacafi may not be the drug for you because it's going to make you more anemic. Or, uh, for example, if you have a, a lot of uh, liver problems, uh, that can become, uh, you know, may not be your drug. So they, I, I don't have an answer there to know which one of the two is better. I have terrible mouth sores five years after transplant. Nothing has helped. And this IV infusion you speak of sounds promising. When is it thought to be approved, and will it help mouth sores? You know, it's a great question. I don't know. The, I know that uh, the, 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 this larger trial that might potentially get to approval if the drug works uh, is, is ongoing. So before having the drug approved, it's going to take a while, a while uh, meaning uh, a few years, uh, but and I don't know if it will ever be approved. So the study is ongoing. And there's a very limited of uh, cases where the study drug end up being approved. So I just need to, you know, kind of clarify that. The, um, lastly, the, yes, the oral GVHD it, at times become a big, big, big issue when they lose a bunch of teeth and the, the dry mouth make it tough to eat, uh, losing weight. Uh, Generally speaking, right there, that's also when you need a lot of care, having, you know, a good, a successful drug. One of these new drugs has to be in the, in the picture, and a lot of oral care is necessary. As you know, also for the eye issue, sometimes when uh, the, the mucosa oral or eye GVHD is established, it's very difficult to make it go away because a lot of, like, a lot of salivary glands are gone, basically. So there's a lot of need for local care of the mouth.
And for example, it's been happening to me a lot to have a lot of discussion with dentists as well. And I have also many patients of mine who are dentists. And there is a lot of things uh, that they can recommend that they could be done, for example, to uh, change the pH inside the mouth, to use a high fluoride uh, toothpaste. The idea is to have uh, a help for, from, uh, from a subspecialist like a dentist, sometimes there are certain dermatologists too that can be, can, can be helpful. I'm on Jacoby. Is that considered immunosuppression? I've had steroid-dependent mouth sores for six years. Jacoby has been very helpful in removing my mouth sores. Yeah. So, yes. So, um, as I mentioned, we don't, uh, we don't consider Jacafi as a standard immune suppressive drug. As a matter of fact, we don't have yet any specific guidelines to tell us that people on Jacafi should be on uh, antibiotics. That said, from uh, studies of people using Jacafi for many years, there has been a signal for those folks to get some infection, like weird fungal infection. So all I'm saying is that uh, my patients on Jacafi, they are only on Jacafi, they come off their, their you know, the, the Bactrim, their Acyclovir, and their antifungal. When is appropriate, they don't have to stay on. But indeed, if they had a history of a fungal infection, or if you did have a history of fungal infection, maybe a consideration to see whether it's worthwhile for you to take an antifungal. But per se, we, we think about Jacafi mostly as an immunomodulatory drug rather than a straight immunosuppressive drug. This will have to be our last question. We're running out of time. Which of the new drugs seems to be better for IGBHD, Jacafi or Resuroc? Wow, so that's, uh, that's a good question. So uh, very quickly, um, we, don't, we don't know which one of the two. That's, that's a short answer. The other thing that you need to know is that the IGVHD is a very tough disease. In my experience, when IGVHD is established, sometimes the drug that you take by mouth doesn't work, uh, no matter what drug you take, because if there is a lot of damage to all the structure that keep the eye wet or, uh, you know, or that make these oils that protect the cornea and the eye, when the damage is established, then uh, you know, is, what you really need is a lot of eye care. So the, the job has to be to prevent the damage to be established. Ultimately, though, between Jacafi and Belumosodil, I, we don't have a data of one being more beneficial to the eyes. Thank you, Dr. Rhoda. On behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, I would like to thank Dr. Roda for his extremely helpful presentation. And thank you for our audience and your excellent questions. Please contact BMT InfoNet if we can help you in any way. Enjoy the rest of your symposium. Thank you.